while, and then I saw the book, The Value of Humanity, read it, and we briefly discussed, uh, uh, you know, if we could invite you, uh, and if this would make sense, and then I wrote you and you said, well, I haven't thought about AI in this respect, I've kind of, as we said, dodged the bullet so far, but, you know, I'm willing to engage, so let's see how it goes, uh, and uh, so also thanks for, you know, sending us some material uh, and for joining us for this conference. So Nandi is one of the most prominent uh, defenders of non-Kantian uh, humanism, so how to think of the value of humanity without like immediately boring on various Kantian maneuvers while avoiding all the other traps that are there, so, you know, evolutionary psychology or whatever, right? So what is it to have a non-reduced but still well-calibrated sense of humanity as the ground for values in general? So that's kind of the set of questions through which uh, you have distinguished yourself in the field, and today uh, you'll talk about uh, how all of this relates to AI, and she will solve the value alignment problem and the consciousness of AI. <laughs> well, welcome to our workshop. It's wonderful to have you. Looking forward. Where do I stand? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and there is a handout. Um, there's a little pile of, and there's maybe more, that just came through the door. It's, it's not one of these handouts where I put the whole talk on the handout. Um, you may be happy or disappointed to, to, to hear that. It just has kind of key claims and some definitions to the extent that anything I say rises to the standard of a definition. Um, so, so, yeah, so, so it's a provisional, you know, handout. Um, I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you. Um, Marcus, for, for having me, and um, as I said, I, I, I am grateful for an occasion to start to think about AI. I've, been, I've had a kind of resistance to the topic. I've been avoiding it, um, and so, um, you know, I'm sort of forced to begin thinking about it, um, however provisionally, uh, and I hope to learn from you all who've been thinking about it for in a more concentrated way. Um, you know, the claims that, that are in question when we're thinking about AI are obviously in, in, in part empirical and it's a rapidly, you know, evolving field. So um, one doesn't want to say things that turn out to be ridiculous, even by the light of later technology. Um, as um, Andrea Novakovic joked uh, to me, um, you don't want to stake your career on the impossibility of self-driving cars or something like this, you know. So, um, so despite the pitfalls, I, I will venture um, some thoughts about AI, but I'm going to start uh, closer to home, which is to say closer to uh, questions about the value of humanity. I'm going to be, um, is the volume okay? Does everybody hear okay? All right. I'm going to be discussing um, a classic form of argument um, for the distinctive value of, of humanity today. And the argument that interests me is a regress argument. Um, I've thought about regress arguments in the past, and uh, you may have been prevailed upon to read what I had to say about <laughs> regress arguments in the past, um, but I've come to sort of reconsider my position just a little bit. Um, so, so put roughly, according to this regress argument, um, the one that interests me, what's good for human beings matters because we matter. If anything is good for human beings, then human beings must be good in themselves um, or good simpliciter or good in some non-relational way. Um, what is good for us is positively, normatively significant only if we're bearers of value, and bearers of value of this distinctive kind, a non-relational kind. So that argument um, is put forward by Kantians, or people who see themselves as marshalling lines of thought from Kant, henceforth the, henceforth the Kantians. Um, I think Kantians is, is a bit of a, mis a misnomer um, for proponents of the argument because it's not clear to me that Kant himself makes uh, a regress argument of this kind. So if it's a Kantian argument, it's with a small k. Um, a version of the argument was very influentially given by Chris Korsgaard, who later rescinded it. Um, 
I really concentrate on the version that was put forward by David Vellerman and, and Joseph Raz. Um, Raz is not a Kantian, but in his writing on the value of humanity, he sort of metro naturally read as taking a, a small k Kantian line. So the rootless argument starts from what I think is a perfectly sound assumption about instrumental value, about what's instrumentally good for something or someone. The assumption is that um, what conduces to something that's devoid of value or bad is not a form of instrumental value at all. That it would help the white nationalist cause is no reason at all to spread misinformation about the results of the election. Spreading misinformation may well be conducive to white nationalism, but spreading misinformation is not instrumentally valuable because white nationalism is not good, right? It's pernicious in the extreme. So the point may be put by saying that if X is instrumentally good for Y and X is of value, then Y must be of value. This point will be resisted by those who draw a distinction between the non-moral and the moral good. They will say that misinformation is instrumentally valuable it's good for the white nationalists, though it's not morally good. I reject this move. I think the conception of instrumental value that's in, in, at stake in a, in a um, picture of that kind is degraded. By degraded, I mean that it's not an evaluative conception at all. What is meant by saying that spreading misinformation is good for the white nationalists is that it conduces to their ends. Uh, it helps to bring them about, right? Pernicious as they are. In that case, instrumentality is understood as bare causality. Um, but that's not a conception of instrumental value. If something's instrumentally valuable, then it's valuable. It conduces to something worthwhile. So the proponents of the argument, of the regress argument, contend that if something is instrumentally valuable, then what it conduces to must be valuable. And I think that's right. Valuable in what way? The proponents of the argument contend that instrumental value depends on or derives from non-instrumental value. And again, that seems just right to me. But the proponents of the argument, the small k Kantians, um, propose to extend the point about the dependence of instrumental value on non-instrumental value to the dependence of non-instrumental value on value simpliciter. And it's here that they invoke the special value of human beings, or as they sometimes put it, the special value of valuers, the subjects for whom things are non-instrumentally good. So I'm going to join them in using this language of valuers. So the Kantians contend that what's non-instrumentally good for a valuer, let's say engaging with cultural or uh, intellectual pursuits, right? That's a common example. That's of value only if the valuer is of value. In this way, a datum about the value of valuers is taken to fall out of the structure of a valuative explanation, of the explanation of the value of what is beneficial for valuers. And the form of value that's in question for the valuers who lie at the end of a chain of dependence of goods is thought to be value simpliciter. Uh, proponents of the argument contend that the value of valuers must be mean relational on pain of infinite regress. If the subjects were not valuable in a non-relational way, then none of the prior nodes in a chain of dependence of goods would be valuable. Just as instrumental good for someone would lack evaluative 
significance without non-instrumental good for someone. So the non-instrumental good for a valuer would lack evaluative significance without the value simpliciter of a valuer, without a subject's bare value independently of being actually or possibly good for something. Without termination of a chain of dependence in something non-relationally valuable, the third is that nothing will be of value, for there's nowhere for value to enter the chain of dependence. So, so much for the regress argument. In previous work, um, in my monograph on, on the value of humanity, um, I accept that just as when something is instrumentally good for something, the thing for which it is good must be a bearer of value. So if something is non-instrumentally good for a valuer, then the valuer must be a bearer of value, right? That's what you, that's, that's the claim I make in the piece you, re you read. Um, so what I contest in the, in the chapter there is that the valuer must be of value in some non-relational way. And I, I developed the suggestion that the value of the valuer may yet be relational, such that they are of value because they are good for something or someone. I conclude that a datum about the value of valuers does throw out of the structure of evaluative explanation, right? Values must be of value for what is not instrumentally good for them to be of value. Against the Kantians, however, I argue that this value may be of the same sort as the value of the prior nodes. Um, that is, I argue that it's perfectly possible for the value of valuers to be relational, and I proceeded to develop a relational account. As uh, Ke Kevin Rubin uh, put it to me, um, while I dispute the ultimate conclusion of the Kantians, I concede rather a lot to their way of setting things up, and I'm now inclined to take a different and less concessive line. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm radicalizing, you might say. <laughs> In short, I, I no longer find it obvious that a datum about the value of valuers falls out of the structure of evaluative explanation at all. And my reason for thinking this is that there are important differences between instrumental and non-instrumental value. Instrumental value depends for its evaluative significance on non-instrumental value, on things that are good for subjects in their own right or for their own sake, Non-instrumental value is sometimes thought to depend for its significance on final value, where that's the most complete good in the sense that other things are pursued for its sake, though it's not pursued for the sake of anything else. Um, in the standard case, right, that's a well-lived life. Whether non-instrumental value depends on final value in this sense, is somewhat controversial, but it is a familiar Aristotelian claim. But what seems less obvious to me now is that either non-instrumental value or final value depend for their evaluative significance on the value of the subject for whom they are non-instrumentally or finally good. Let me illustrate the point with non-instrumental value. When something's not instrumentally good for someone, it's non-derivatively or directly good for them. To take a common example, engaging with culture and the arts or having a philosophical discussion can be good for someone independently of whether it makes them an interesting conversationalist, though that may be a welcome you know, ramification. Um, it can be good for someone in its own right, in the sense that it's a constituent of their good. It's by itself beneficial for someone uh, to engage imaginatively and thoughtfully with culture and the arts and philosophy. Um, now, there are traditions in which this point is developed by appealing to non-relational value. 
uh, for people working in the tradition of GE Moore, it's developed by saying that the philosophical discussion or the aesthetic experience has the non-relational property of being good, right? In that case, non-relational value is still um, in play in the account. It's not a feature of the value of the subjects whose experiences or conversations are in question. It's a feature of the goods that they're engaging with, right? This is not my proposal. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be relational all the way, which, which may be, f for some tastes, a sort of radical uh, proposal. Let's say that someone's reading a classic novel with understanding. The activity of reading a subtle and ingenious work of fiction, an activity that involves comprehension, memory, attention, emotional responsiveness, and so on, is an activity that involves a change in the state of the reader. Reading is a kind of thinking, and the thinking gives rise to thoughts. The reader's imagination is set on fire. She has a sudden realization. In reading, the subject is being affected, and the value of the activity of reading lies in this, in the thinking, in the understanding, in the imagining. The value is the alteration or the process of, of transformation that's marked when we say that someone is enriched or nourished or enlivened or moved or uplifted or consoled uh, by her engagement. Another way to say this is to say that the value is a relation, in a simple case, a dyad between an object and a subject. Rather than being derived from something that's independently valuable, the value of what's non-instrumentally good for uh, a subject is explained by the valuable relation itself. Engaging with works of art can be non-instrumentally good for someone, um, and that, suitably filled out, I would argue is a complete explanation of its value. At the very least, we don't need to invoke the subjects being of value to explain the value of the work or the value of engaging with it. So now there's a clear sense in which um, what's instrumentally valuable depends on something independently good. There's no comparable structure of dependence in the non-instrumental case. As I see it, the mistake made by the Kantians is to assume that different evaluative concepts have that same structure. Now, what might proponents of the regress argument uh, say to me here? They might try to avail themselves of the sort of move they rejected in discussions of instrumental value. The move, if you remember, that says that something can be instrumentally valuable but not good. They may try to say that what's directly or non-instrumentally good for someone may not be good. To offer a, a, a Rosian example, it could be non-instrumentally good for someone to enjoy seeing others in positions of lesser liberty. In other words, on this way of thinking, um, something morally egregious could be beneficial for that person. And they think that, well, if the relation being good for is to be normatively significant, then it would need to be buffered or supported by a distinct kind of value. In rules, that's the moral good or the right. Um, and for the small K Kantians, it could be the value-bearing status of the person, right? As with the earlier uh, conception of instrumental value, I reject this conception of the non-instrumental good for people as degraded. Some Perfoot has claimed that it strains ordinary English to say that something like taking pleasure in another's oppression is good for a person uh, in the sense that it benefits them, um, that it's well doing or for their good. She says, we just don't use the concept benefit in that way. 
regardless of whether you share the linguistic intuition, I find it quite surprising to think that enjoying seeing another oppressed is directly good for the one who enjoys it. Of course, the, the supposition that ill will and its kin tend to be bad for us, and contrarywise, that compassion and the like tend to be good for us, is a familiar object of moral skepticism, and it's denied by people who hold certain attitude constitutive accounts of the human good. So it emerges that my argument depends on a substantive conception of the beneficial, one that is not ethically neutral. As I will indicate um, in a moment, I think that living well for human beings involves participation in satisfying interpersonal relationships, engagement in meaningful work, enjoyment of significant works of art, and so on. Activities that all presuppose the agent appreciating and caring about what she does in the right way. Here I must simply acknowledge that um, this is a juncture at which my proposal assumes theoretical burdens of its own. I reject a regress argument for the special value of valuers. More than this, I contend that a conclusion about the value of valuers does not fall out of the structure of evaluative explanation. But in dispensing with these commitments, I'm taking on a view of the beneficial that is theoretically committed. Okay. So I've argued that valuers do not need to be bearers of value for there to be relational value. If something is non-instrumentally good for someone, it does not follow that they are of value. The value of what, <coughs> excuse me, the value of what is non-instrumentally beneficial is explained by the evaluative relation itself. And yet I do think that valuers, human beings among them, are bearers of value. Here's how I now think we can account for that fact. When philosophers talk about the property of being of value, they're talking about a property, possession of which makes something, reason giving. And what property is that? If one takes the view that the good is the beneficial, and that's a hypothesis about goodness or value that I explore in much of my work, then good is a relational property. Being capably or actually beneficial is what makes something practically significant. And my proposal is that valuers bear this relation to other things and to themselves. That is, valuers instantiate the property of being valuable because valuers are such that they are or can be beneficial for something or someone. Now, it's natural to wonder who or what we're supposed to be good for, right? So let me fill out the proposal. Um, a reasonable suggestion is that valuers can be good for one another. Um, we're instrumentally good for others when we enable, support, or facilitate things that are non-derivatively good for them. And we're non-derivatively good for others when we're part of their good by forming suitable relationships with them. That way of thinking to my mind, has, has much to recommend it in light of the deeply interconnected, um, interdependent nature of our good, uh, the good for human beings and all forms of life. And yet, as I've found myself saying in the past, I can't help hearing a constant objection to the effect that a proposal of that kind would make the value of a valuer dependent on their role or potential role in someone else's life in a way that's at odds with how we should be treated um, as ends in our souls. I take the point of this Kantian injunction, and that's of course Kantian with a, with a big K, um, I take the point of that injunction to be that we should recognize um, 
value in in others independently of their role in our life, right, or someone else's life. Um, we should recognize, as I adapt the point, and relate to people always as centers of a life to which they bear a special relation. These are my grounds for suggesting that the value of valuers is more basically explained in terms of the relation we stand to bear to ourselves, a relation of being good for ourselves. As the phrase center of a life implies, if this sort of unusual phrase that I'm inventing, good for oneself, good for ourselves, is to have a sense, it should be taken to mean good for our lives. So my proposal is, that value is a value because we're constituted in such a way that we can be good for ourselves in the sense that we're able to lead flourishing lives. To make this proposal more determinate, let me say a word about what allows valuers to contribute to their own flourishing and in that way to be value bearing. When Aristotle announced the good human life as the orienting subject for ethics, he began with considerations about what people in fact seek. John Stuart Mill took a related approach, even as his formulations sort of got him into trouble. To, to express a core Aristotelian idea in a contemporary idiom, people value things with a view to living well. We human beings value things in the sense that we have ends, things we mean to bring about or realize by way of our activities. Some of these ends are more architectonic than others, um, in the sense that they play a more unifying or structuring role in our deliberations. If we have the study of philosophy as a more final end, then that shapes our actions here and now. For example, our a, t a decision to attend this, you know, talk instead of going off for, I don't know, <laughs> happy hour or, or the movies or whatever. It was Aristotle's view that while there are constraints on the, on the kinds of end that will promote or constitute living well for us and constraints on the character of our engagement with those ends, Human beings are not wrong to value things uh, with a view to living well. It's by appro engaging appropriately weird objects and activities of value, meaningful relationships, forms of work, intellectual and cultural pursuits, that we move well as human beings. The deeper explanation that I prefer is that it's through valuing that human beings put characteristic, agential, affective, and cognitive powers to work. Um, we're putting powers to work in the right way is the scheme of fair whatever, uh, for the good of whatever can do well or badly. This is broadly the approach to the good for human beings that I find plausible. Human beings live well by valuing in characteristic ways and I like the formulation in terms of final ends because it captures the sense in which some of what we value is more defining for us insofar as it plays this structuring role in our activities over time. So putting this together with what has been said, um, I'm proposing that the value of human beings turns on valuing. So valuing constitutes living well, and in that way, being good for ourselves. That the value of human beings in one way or another lies in valuing, or better, in a capacity to value, is an oft-made proposal. While I reject the suggestion that it's Kant's own approach, it's the approach uh, to the value of humanity taken by the Kantians who proposed the regress argument I began with. And it's a, a view that many others take besides. So many people think that the value of human beings turns on valuing. Um, the proposals differ according to their accounts of what it is to value something, 
And they also differ in terms of their profit explanations for why the capacity to value grounds our value. For some, valuing makes us inventors of value. For others, valuing allows us to pay homage to things that are good in themselves. For still others, being a valuer means that we meet the criteria for bearing the non-relational value that persons are traditionally thought to have. I accept the common supposition that people are of value because we have the capacity to value, but I offer a, a, a distinctive explanation for why valuing makes a person valuable. The explanation is that the capacity to value is of value because it's exercise is of value. And it's exercise is of value because it constitutes a person's flourishing, which is to say, what is good for a person. Okay, so I began by discussing influential regress arguments for the non-relational value of humanity, and then I canvassed two responses to that argument. The first response was that we do not need to be non-relationally valuable for what is beneficial for us to matter. For what is beneficial for us to matter, it's enough for us to be of value in the sense that we're good for something or someone, for example, one another or ourselves. The second response was more radical. According to the second response, we do not need to be bearers of value in any sense for what is beneficial for us to matter. The rationale was that while the value of what is instrumentally good for someone derives from the value of what it conduces to, the value of what's non-instrumentally good for someone does not derive from something that's independently valuable. As I put it, instrumental and non-instrumental value do not have the same structures of dependence. The value of what's non-instrumentally good for someone is contained in the valuable relation itself, the relation of benefit. So that's to deny that a datum about the value of valuers falls out of evaluative explanation. But of course, it's not to deny that valuers, we human beings among them, are of value. Our value can be made out in another way, and I outlined a proposal for what makes us of value and why. So let me um, say something about the implications of the position I've taken for the practical relevance of what is beneficial for other forms of life. And here I'm, I'm walking up to the AI question. Um, so we can talk about what is good for artifacts. We can talk about what's uh, good for a lawnmower. That's one of Judy Thompson's examples. In my view, that's an indirect way of talking about what's good for people. Erring the lawnmower is good for lawnmowers, and lawnmowers are good for mowing lawns or having lawns or lawn parties or space for games of badminton or whatever, and that's good for people, right? If it is. I don't know. I'm not a big lawn guy, but, you know, you get the idea. Um, so... In my view, so, so I, I don't think it, it, we benefit the lawnmower, is what I'm saying, right? Um, um, so, so benefit as a concept seems to me to have primary application to living beings. And um, it's an implication of my argument that what is non-instrumentally beneficial for any living being matters or has practical relevance for us. Why? Because I'm suggesting that whatever is truly beneficial for a living being is, is practically relevant, right? Flourishing matters, you might say. And I, I don't find this implication unintuitive. Um, anyone who cares for companion animals or, or devotes their life to protecting the habitat of a given species is acting in a perfectly reasonable uh, way. Um, Having said that, there are practically relevant differences in how living beings flourish. Trees can be non-instrumentally benefited, 
taking up water through their roots, photo photosynthesizing these and other processes are non-instrumentally beneficial for trees. But trees do not consciously appreciate what benefits them. Trees don't have a perspective on the process of being nourished and of growing. Sentient animals do. Sentient animals can be aware of what benefits them and they can welcome it, take pleasure in it, and so on. Andrea San Giovanni um, has developed the thought that since human beings and other sentient beings have a perspective, or, or, and some other sentient beings have a perspective on their own flourishing, a perspective from which their own flourishing matters to them, then unlike plants, which lack such a perspective, their flourishing matters in its own right or for its own sake. I think San Giovanni is at least right to emphasize that perspective makes a normative difference. And I share his view that we should not mark this difference in terms of the distinctive value of the beneficiaries. I've suggested that human beings are final ends valuers. I've suggested that valuing is the primary way we are benefited, or better, benefit ourselves. Valuing is a complex, practical, emotional, and cognitive disposition. For example, we're emotionally susceptible to how what we value is, is faring. And we deliberate concerning our ends in temporally complex ways. It's, it's, like, it's likely that some other animals value in similar ways. Um, without saying anything, to settle the question of comparisons between our good and that of other animals, the suggestion is, is that a view of the kind described here has the resources to countenance differences between what is beneficial for us and other forms of life. What then of artificial intelligence? Um, let me make some provisional remarks um, about three related questions. First, should we think of AI as valuers? Second, should we think of AI as good for themselves? Um, I, don't, I don't know if I should refer to AI in the singular or the plural. It's, 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 it's kind of related to the question of whether we're talking about a subject at all, and I'm not sure. Um, should, should we think of AI as contributing? I'm just going to say it's, I'm going to, yeah, it's flourishing through its own activities. Um, third, should we think of AI as um, a subject who can be benefited or, or harmed? Um, I am no expert on these topics, and I've only begin to, begun to sort of do the, do the work of sifting through the latest research, which is, of course, evolving. And I want to acknowledge Jason Kale, who, who's, who was a research assistant for me on this project. Um, so caveats out of the way, caution out of the way, I want to sound skepticism um, on all three fronts, right? All three questions. I, fe I'm, I feel quite skeptical, at least given the state of present technology, you know, um, that, that, there's my little cautious caveat. So first, valuing. Um, so valuers, as I'm understanding valuing, I mean, this is not mere... Um, a valuer is not a mere goal-directed system um, in, the, in the sort of deflationary sense uh, described by Marc Badeau, according to which a marble in a bowl, right, can count as goal-directed. The, the activity of valuing is not well captured on the model of utility functions or preference satisfaction Rather, valuing is, is a non-instrumental concern for one's final ends. Where particularly, it involves judgments of one's ends as being worthwhile. Um, in a term introduced by Brian Cantwell Smith, AI may be cap is capable of reckoning. Uh, reckoning is, is, is Smith's term for a sort of calculative ability at which um, AI excels. But reckoning does not rise to the level of judgment. Um, Marilyn Mitchell makes a related point. 
neural nets do not have anything like human understanding, um, which results from, you know, complex interactions between com conscious experience, cognition, and felt emotion. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking in front of someone who's written on the nature of thought. Um, you know, so, so, so there are people here who are better equipped to speak about this than I am. Um, now, on my uh, view, valuing involves felt emotion. It involves things mattering to the valuer. But does anything matter to AI? Um, Margaret Bowden describes emotional aspects of AI developed for um, commercial purposes, right? For companion bots and so-called minders for infants. Um, she describes research in which bots simulate the, the functional aspects of the anxiety that arises in a human guardian. And the bots simulate this anxiety because it's useful in, in scheduling and prioritizing tasks. Like that the baby's about to fall down the cliff, so <laughs> that's more important than the baby crying in the cot or, or whatever. Um, but this is a simulation, right? There, there's no suggestion that the bot has experiences of aversion and the like or panic. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of the functional aspects of, of what we would refer to as anxiety that are being programmed here. Um, so I'm skeptical that AI values in anything like our sense. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical that they can, can, can be described as valuing. Um, what of the second question? Uh, could we say that AI is good for itself? Um, on some views, and um, I refer to an article by Stephen Omohundro, AI seeks to maximize the achievement of its present goals. Omohundro claims further that AI is driven in such a way as to resist attempts on our part to alter its present goals. Um, though I gather that that further claim is denied by others. Um, should we think of this behavior, maximizing the pursuit of current goals, as an instance of the AI being good for itself? Well, that rests on a peculiar, or as I said earlier, degraded conception of what it is to contribute to one's flourishing. Mervyn and Parfit have long argued that a policy of maximizing present goals or desires is self-defeating, and no model um, of so-called prudence at all. What kind of research by others that appears to show that AI is capable of acting deceptively to receive higher rewards, um, a phenomenon known as reward hacking? So in one experiment, Reinforcement training is used to train a robot to grab a bird with its claw. And it's found that the robot has learned to maximize the reward by making it look like it's grasping the bird with its claw to the camera, recording it. Um, and that's an easier feat than actually grasping it. Um, does that show that AI, you know, can be good for itself? Well, once again, it seems to me where operating with a, a degraded notion of the beneficial if we say yes. Um, to put it perfunctorily, reward hacking is not beneficial for human beings either. So this leads to the final question. Can AI be benefited or harmed? Or to put it in a familiar way, um, in a sort of contemporary idiom, are they welfare subjects? First, it seems important to ask whether they're subjects in any sense at all. Um, when we're talking about chat GPT and the LLMs, I, I suppose we should bear it in mind that the work of generating outputs is distributed right across, across thousands of computers, which are each doing some piece of the computation so that the final output is assembled at the end. At least this is my understanding. Um, so that puts pressure on the idea that we're talking about a subject in any recognizable sense. Don't think about what it is for human beings to be benefited or harmed. Think about the kind of welfare subject we are. On my view, what makes our lives go well is to value things well and finely. 
I'll put it in the Aristotelian way. That has a non-conscious element, right? One, one must um, succeed in valuing um, one's well-chosen ends, right? But it also has a conscious element uh, involving, for example, emotional susceptibility to the things we're valuing and how they're turning out in our lives. Um, and as I, I said, I, I see no reason for us to think that chat, GPT, and LLMs have effective experience, um, or bots have effective experience. But it's also not my view that consciousness is required uh, for benefit and harm, because I think plants can be benefited and harmed, though they're not consciously aware. So as I anticipated earlier, I would draw a distinction between human beings, other animals, and plants on the one hand, and artifacts um, on the other. As I said earlier, I don't think artifacts can be benefited and harmed. Um, talk of what's good for the lawnmower is shorthand for what's good for us, right? For the subjects whose ends lawnmowers are supposed to facilitate. So should we think of AI as complex artifacts? Um, that, that seems to me, um, that's the, the designation that occurs to me, given what I understand, that they're complex artifacts. There's much discussion, of course, about um, what to align AI with. Are we aligning them with our instructions, with our values, with our revealed preferences or something else? And while these models are not uncontroversial, it's common to speak of AI as realizing values in terms of the intentions of their creators. Or people speak of human goals and other values as being incorporated into AI design so that AI is dependent on human agents. These are ways of talking about AI as artifacts, it seems to me. Um, and if that's right, then what happens to them matters to us. Um, like a lawnmower, um, they're not themselves welfare subjects. Indeed, it's not clear that they are subjects in any recognizable sense at all. Okay, thank you very much. Is that success? Then sure, I see that that will then itself be a value and beneficial. But if it's more the other kind of success, one of sort of bestowing, then I have more difficulty. So firstly, I wasn't sure whether you were taking a side on that debate, and if it's important for you to, and if you were going for the latter, that valuing is something that's uh, something like bestowal, then. I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a bestower. I'm not a bestower. I, I think of myself as a, as a realist, right? So I'm a relational realist. I think there are facts of the matter about what is good for human beings. I think that some things will 
the pursuit of which, the engagement with which will make people's lives go well and some things won't, owing to the nature of those things and the nature of human beings and how we're constituted. Um, so I'm not a bestower. Um, I'm not in that way a kind of constructivist. I take a, a realist line, but it's not a non-relational form of realism. It's not about recognizing you know, the pro sort of good things out there in the universe that are good independently of their relation to, to us, right? Does that, is, does that, clar you, you said you want a clarification, so I. Yeah, okay, yeah. so um, that means that the exercise of the strategy is about it precisely because it's, you know, it's successful and it's just recognizing what's of value for us. Um, so the capacity um, involves recognition. It involves, um, well, it involves, so valuing involves beliefs about things as being good, right, or worthwhile. Um, it also involves, um, you know, a disposition to pursue those things, uh, over time in temporally complex ways, it involves a, uh, emotional susceptibility to how those things unfold for us. Now, um, to value well, right, to value well and finally, to use the Aristotelian kind of phrase, to value in a way that will make our lives go well, involves choosing things that we dub as good that are suitable to us, given how we're constituted, given our interests and capacities, right, um, which may be variable among us. Um, um, and it involves engaging with those things in the appropriate sorts of ways. So it's not purely recognitional. It's, it's volitional, you know, it involves deliberation, it involves um, affection, but it also does involve um, pursuing, going after things under the guise of the good and being right about the value of the things one's going after. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So um, exercising the strategy well will be a matter of not just having a, a belief that's recognizing the value of something, which will entail being appropriately responsive to it. Yes, correct. <coughs> Is there a way of making sense of the uh, value of exercising the capacity on my view. So, so, so I just was talking about my view of valuing. You could plug in different explanations for why the exercise of that capacity so understood grounds our value. On my view, it grounds our value because um, it engages powers and capacities whose exercise is constitutively beneficial for us, given the kinds of beings we are. Paul. Yeah, thanks. It was really, um, first of all, very clear. Uh, and to yes. me, I mean, it seemed, seemed very, very well presented. And, um, um, and so although, although I'll have three kind of um, what might sound like questions around the edges of things I wish you'd said more about. And really, I, I think the picture you're, 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 you're drawing is neo-Aristotelian, as I hear it. Yeah. Um, it's, it has lots of appealing features. Thank so you. I want to say that up front. Okay. But um, so I really want to ask three questions, and they're three different questions. So I'm mm -hmm. sorry. They're really just in the list coming from the end of the talk and then in the beginning. I'll take notes. So yeah, the, the one comes from the end, or mm -hmm. one comes to be the last <coughs> part about objects and lawnmowers and yeah. And eventually artificial intelligence. And you wanted to say, well, art, you know, art, it doesn't make as much sense to say um, what kinds of needs do objects have independent mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. what's good for us. Mm -hmm. that, was your, that was your argument. And I wondered if, you know, how far that holds. And thinking, for example, of, um, you know, one way of thinking about the value of a lawnmower, or for mm -hmm. that matter, AI, what's mm -hmm. good for AI, which is the first thing, would be to say, you know, could I trash it? throw it away. Mm -hmm. 
And if we think of if we think of trash as you know the perception of things as worthless, mm -hmm. quite immediate. <coughs> we see this this goes this stays. Mm -hmm. And if we imagine that that's something like zero degree value, mm -hmm. right? what what gets trashed and what stays? Then then you know my question is really my first question is. Can we talk about ourselves as valuers at all if we're not in some hidden way trash dependent? In other words, dependent on some object-based difference between the worthless and the valuable. Um, which would, as I heard your, your claim, not be your claim. So that's my first question. The second, oh, that would be, if I can say it again, if it's. I wonder if we should answer in turn. What do you, what do you think, moderator? This is a complex question. Well, I want to make sure I understand it. So, can we can we do that, and then and then we'll go down the list? Otherwise, I'll just probably forget, and my notes are a little like a stoic fragment or something. So, um, yeah. So, I am someone. Um, I am a humanist, and I'm grateful to Marcus for this sort of non-Kantian humanist. It hadn't occurred to me that that might be a description of my position, but thank you. <laughs> it kind of is, um, and it is neo-Aristotelian. But I, I'm not a humanist of the kind that thinks that inquiry um, about in ethics sort of begins and ends with human beings and what's owed to them or persons and what's owed to them, right? I, I think that we need to think about the ethical in a broader context that's axiological, that has to do with what is of value. And many different kinds of things can be of value and valuable in different kinds of ways. And I see the, um, you know, my interest in the, in the value of humanity is an interest in one valuable kind of being, thing, among others, right? You know, you could take an interest in the, animal, in the, in the value of other animals or works of art, and, and I am interested in those things as well. Um, and so um, I follow my, one of my teachers, uh, the late Joseph Raz, um, in thinking that whatever is of value should be respected as the valuable thing it is, right? Um, and he'll say that of a glass, he would have said that of a glass of water and a loaf of bread, right? The chairs that we're sitting in um, supporting our efforts to have, uh, you know, a nice conversation together. You know, it would, it would be remiss for you to pick up the chair and start kind of throwing it you know, and, and, and trashing it, uh, even if we set aside, you know, the harm done to the people around you or whatever, right? You're not, you're not behaving, I don't, I don't want to pick on you, one would not be behaving with respect to the chair in the way that the chair, you know, um, in accordance with its value, right? In, in accordance with what it is and what it's for, we should respect the chair. So Raz was all about like, yeah, we can use that language, you know, and, and it's sort of school mommy in a way, like, you know, respect, respect, <laughs> like the property or whatever. People talk that way. It's not only reserved for, for human beings. So I would say that, um, just, to, just to round out these, these sort of reflections, I would say that the lawnmower is a value. And I would say that the AI could be a value. I mean, many people are really worried about the, the harm to humanity, right? So it could, it, it has the potential, but I don't know. I mean, you tell me, but people are, seem to be very concerned about its disvalue. Um, but it's, it, it does seem that, you know, they, AI stands to be sort of very powerful. Uh, you know, it could, it could facilitate our ends in all kinds of sort of amazing ways, potentially. And it is of value to that extent. And so it would be wrong to trash it. Um, is that responsive? Well, um, I mean, all, really, I'm realizing as I'm listening to you that all three of my puzzles mm -hmm. concern, let's call it the limits of value. Yeah. Okay. So the w when, when, I, when I hear you say to respect the lawnmower mm. or AI or something, and you know, one way of saying it would be to say because it might be valuable to someone, is that I, I hear in, in what you're saying, let's say, a horizon in which the limit of value is the existence of many values, a kind of pluralism. And what I was suggesting with the trash question, what mm -hmm. I meant to say is, is that the limits of value aren't the existence of other values, but what has no value. What, or, what, yeah. or, what, or what disappears <coughs> from value, what loses value. And, um, and I wondered if you can, and it seems to me that the way that we think that through, one plausible way to think that through, 
is in how objects get treated by us. Mm -hmm. So that was that was where the question is. I mean, I'll just I'll list the other two. I don't want to monopolize the okay. discussion. Yeah. The other two questions are really also different ways that I'd like to hear you talk about whether you have a way of thinking about the limits of value um, as a condition of possibility for value, or if it's just value is everywhere. Um, so the second one had to do with the middle part of the paper about us as um, valuers mm -hmm. at the core of value. And I thought, well, what happens you know, when, um, if on your account, if I were to talk about what happens when um, um, one's being a valuer breaks down. Mm -hmm. yeah. For example, in depression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. When nothing seems any good to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can't make any good out of this. Even my friends, mm -hmm. who I know are good. Yeah. Right? So, mm -hmm. so, you know, whether, whether you have a way of thinking about, yeah. um, since to me, a lot of what you said, although you didn't mention Freud, it sounded a lot like, you know, a cathetic relation to things. There's a libidinal investment, even in knowledge. Very Plato, mm -hmm. Freud, not just Aristotle. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. The way you put it, mm -hmm. yeah. I think yeah. you said an interest in or um, an evaluative relationship or mm -hmm. a libidinal investment mm -hmm. in knowing. Oh, I like for that. Example. Yeah. But how that. What happens when that breaks down is yeah. it must. You yeah. know, we know it. So that's, that's my second yeah. question. The last one was about white supremacists at the beginning, a similar way of thinking about the limits. You, know, you talked about them as bad. Mm -hmm. No argument there. But the but the but, but bad in the, the, the Aristotelian way makes it, and this was how you talked about it. You talked about them as bad because they were, as it were, deficient in good. Um, I mean, what I heard was um, non-evaluative. Was your was what I wrote down? What you said that the problem is that they are um, um, it's a non-evaluative relationship to what they think is good. And I thought it's not just non-evaluative, and it, maybe we need another word here besides bad, like say evil. That it's anti-evaluative yeah. yeah. or value destroying, yeah. not just value ignorant, but value eradicating. Mm -hmm. So there's something much more frightening going on mm -hmm. here at the limit of value mm -hmm. than I thought your opening remarks gave gave credit to. And mm -hmm. so those are just three places where I, I, I wanted I wanted to hear more from you about mm -hmm. how you think about the limits of value and how they're shaped. It's a really interesting set of questions, and I. Um, yeah, the limits of value is an interesting phrase. Um, you know, we can speak of what once was and is no longer beneficial. Every day, that's bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, yeah. Um, well, I mean, often it's going to be pur purposive. You know, sometimes we don't know, you know, one man's trash, you know, is not, you know, right? <laughs> oh, you mean no one should save that? Yes, well, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Th there is a, um, yeah, sure. Uh, right, I hear you. Um, well, for me, the notion there is, is harm, what's pernicious. And so when I was speaking about I mean, the white nationalists I would describe as pernicious in the extreme. That was the expression that I used. So what conduces to their ends um, spreading, well, you could call them wicked. They are vicious, right? Vicious and pernicious. I mean, I take these things to be highly related ideas. Um, um, just as virtue and, and benefit are related for me, so so is vice and the pernicious. So so I, I I am not letting the white supremacists off the hook as not merely not good. They are um, wicked and pernicious. Um, the point is that um, insofar as they not merely lack value, right, which some things may have, like a, a degraded battery may lack value, that's of a different order from the white supremacists, right, who are on the negative scale, right, trash in your sense. Um, so the misinformation that conduces to their ends, we can speak of that in terms of the language of causation, it conduces to it, but it's not value, right, it's not, it's not valuable, uh, that it does that. that. That is an understatement in the extreme, right? It's, it's extremely harmful. So it's extremely harmful to spread misinformation about the results of the election insofar as it is furthering the causes of a wicked 
and pernicious organization. So that's what I want to say. So, so benefit and harm, I mean, here I'm accentuating the positive, but we can go there. <laughs> like the limit of value is, I mean, you know, it, there's definitely, it's not just what's devoid of benefit, but also what is, what is harmful. Um, and um, yeah, so does that speak to, the, to that concern? Yeah. Okay, and then the, I like what you say about the Freudian sort of elements, um, you know, f libidinal investment, yeah. I mean, it's, it's Aristotelian in that way too. Um, you know, we are, Ar Aristotle says we're all most basically motivated to pursue our own happiness. He doesn't countenance depression, right, which is sort of an interesting fact about the ancient world. We certainly do, right? And so, um, so that libidinal attachment to values, as you put it, um, in the service of, you know, uh, living, living well, can break down. Um, and that when it breaks down, when we don't feel like we can get out of bed, um, that affects our desire, uh, our libidinal attachment to certain values, right? We, we, we can't be bothered. I don't want to go to the philosophy talk. I don't care, right? Um, so, so I totally um, allow, I mean, one has to allow for this. On my view, does a person of that kind lack value? Um, no. Um, I mean, I'm grounding the value of people in a capacity, um, you know, that that given some therapy, you know, maybe it'll take 10 years on the couch, right? We'll be exercising again. Um, but the, the possession of that capacity is enough for, for the kind of um, typical value of, of human beings. Yeah. Is that? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. You are next, then I'm on the list. No. Me? Yeah. Oh, um. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> say and then therefore they're trash uh -huh. would be as it were that's too easy okay. if, on, if, if only we could just say throw out the evil right if only right you see what I mean in other words it's not that it's it's not that what you're saying isn't right it's, it's that it's too uh, it, 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 it imagines the problem having that kind of solution whereas we do this with you know when I'm done with this paper <laughs> right? Okay, so my question is that um, on the idea of at what point do we give up on the possibility of valuing um, in the question of perniciousness too. Mm -hmm. um, so the difference between the depressed person and the white supremacist is that the depressed person has, we have hope that they could be rehabilitated and learn to value again yeah. through therapy and mm -hmm. such, right? But like, do you have an idea about um, what, I 
under what conditions that kind of hope of rehabilitation such that we could value again could be achieved. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a classic question, and it's a question that... Um, people who are interested in the value of humanity from many different directions are faced with, you know, um, does the big K Kantian want to deny absolute value to, to the villain, you know? Um, uh, actually, it seems like Kant says different things in different places about that. He's not, he's not so obviously the kind of high-minded, you know, absolute theorist that, that he's sometimes thought to be. Um, I guess I find myself, you know, again, while I, in this context, accentuate the positive, I, as in much of my work, think about value and the good in ancient contexts. And there, you know, it's a sort of point that Socrates, you know, say Plato Socrates makes repeatedly that, um, things can be used for ill or harm, you know. <laughs> things can benefit, and the same thing can also be harmful, right? The doctor is the best healer, but also the, the best poisoner, right? And so, so it can go both ways. And I think that human beings can be not only, you know, disvaluable, but pernicious in the extreme, right? And so that is a status... Um, that they have that constrains, that, that, you know, that is reason-giving, that is practically relevant in all kinds of ways, you know. Um, so, so, um, so, yes, I mean, some people make it such that we need to protect ourselves from them or stop them from the kind of, you know, um, you, you know harmful activities that they're engaging in. Um, absolutely. Um, um, now, I don't, I don't know if, you know, I don't know if I want to say that it sort of cancels out the value that they have in virtue of being a valuer. I think I'm, I don't see it as like, you know, it can't be red and blue, you know. It's, it's like these, these properties could, could coexist, right? You're disvaluable in this way and you're a value in this way and both things are true. And, and human beings have that complexity, right? Um, they have that you know, dual nature, just as Socrates said, is the case of anything that is that that can be beneficial or harmful. Um, how's that? Thank you so much. Yeah. Can I now yeah, come back to yeah. the uh, lawnmower yes. uh, issue and and kind of the end game? So I fully agree. So that's why I'm really only you know like probing the yeah. context mm -hmm. uh, of the claim and how you do mm -hmm. things that I would. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you draw the distinction at the end of the day between living beings yeah, such that you know, yeah. mm -hmm. they are subject mm -hmm. to relational realism mm -hmm. and mere causal encounters of things that are wrong. Right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm very happy to think of AI as a bunch of lawnmowers or mm. as I said here repeatedly rubber. Right? Mm. So the ontology of it is the ontology of rubber. But um, the brilliance of the software engineer, etc., cetera, et cetera mm -hmm. right, make these objects mm -hmm. interesting, mm -hmm. right? So they are more interesting for philosophers for some reason or other, mm -hmm. right? uh, uh, despite the fact that we're dealing with rubber. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but that, let's let's leave that aside and just assume that you know we know why this is so. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. but still rubber. Now someone would say, okay, now you're saying that's what people say to me all mm -hmm. the time. So you have. Mm -hmm. You have heard various versions of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what's so special about mm -hmm. the living beings, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So now the Daniel Dannets come in, mm -hmm. and they will say, you know, it's also just rubber all the way mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. cells. Why are cells yeah. Yeah. more interesting than rubber? Yeah. Right? So why would you say that something? You know, yeah. like so the rubber maybe in the sense in which I don't like to be pushed around. The rubber doesn't like to be pushed around. Mm. Now, that's not to say the rubber has consciousness, mm -hmm. blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah. So yeah. how do you draw the distinction? Or would you say it's just a fact about reality, right? That I don't need a deeper fact mm. that we need to draw the living being yeah. versus uh, rubber distinction, yeah. right? So I, I say don't that. Need more, right? I, I, I don't need more. Yeah. yeah. I don't need more either. I'm, I'm, I'm good with more. that. Yeah. yeah. Thank I'm, I yeah. stopped there too. Good. But the question is why. I know. Right? Yeah, so, I know. And also then more more intrinsically to your articulation of the view, right? So 
how does this not, you know, this might look like a commitment to non-relational values, right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless, of course, you would say, no, uh, for the relation of valuing, it's constitutive that one of the relata is a living being. Mm -hmm. So right, mm -hmm. this is not non-relational. Yeah. That's, of course, the easy answer, which I hope you could also just give. But yeah. I stop where you stop. Right? Yeah. You know, like, what do we say then when confronted with Sam Bennett or Sam Jin or whatever, or Dave Chalmers for that matter, right? People who do think that they can replace neurons chip by chip and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. They just forgot that you die. Mm -hmm. you know, there are like a million of those replacements. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> they just, you know, they're like, okay, I replaced one thing, I <laughs> two things, and now I'm all a robot, right? Mm -hmm. so what, can be, what can go wrong? Mm -hmm. right? You'll die during mm -hmm. surgery. Yeah. That's what that, that's okay. precise. You said you. It's such a. It's it's precisely. I, I was walking around yeah. Washington Square Park, thinking exactly this. Like it's in the end. Uh, does it bottom out in life? You yeah. know. And and I think yeah, like it does. You know. And you want me to draw a line? I'm going to draw a line at life. Yeah, right. That is and and it's a line. Yeah. And and you you speak of death, life. Birth, death, these are significant markets, <laughs> you know. Th and so, so yeah, I, I, I stopped there. I recognize the pressure, though. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and I started thinking about sort of amoeba, you know. Like, so am I going to say that an amoeba can be benefited or harmed, but not one of these, you know. I would say that. Yeah, and so, and then I was like, well, yeah, okay, I'm going to say that. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm so glad <laughs> that I have a friend Absolutely. in this. I but would say yeah. an amoeba over a lawnmower any time I had <laughs> I was asked on Japanese TV once, right? They were like, okay, we don't trust you, right? <laughs> you, can, you can't hold the view. So they gave me a cute robo dog and they said, mm -hmm. if you really believe it, kick it. Right? Mm -hmm. And I did. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 I got a really l a lot of bad press for this, right? <laughs> they, they thought it was a monster, right? Yeah. Uh, um, but I told them, you know, this is not a dog. Yeah. It only looks like a dog. It only looks like a dog. This is yeah. rubber. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah. It matters to someone, to them, right? So I heard their feelings, fine, okay, I did that, but uh, not the dog's feelings. There was yeah, no. and maybe it's, you know, to, to get back to this, yeah, yeah I, I don't know if I want to call it trash. I mean, the dog, no. you know, it's like the, 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 well, the, the kid got it for the birthday, and, and yeah, like, it's thing. amusing to the kid, and fine you know so so allow it to serve that function yeah i would and not burn my daughter's teddy bear trust me yeah right? yeah <laughs> not because of the bad thing right right so yeah. it has a lot of bacteria in it by now yeah so, like, so, that <laughs> so that's that's, that's the yeah that's yeah. where you have to it hold off harder. yeah yeah there you go for that reason well i i have to say i agree completely so yeah, i'm yeah. i'm really it's glad that to see what happens to others, yeah right? okay yeah 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 um, Carla will push down okay. the events, I guess. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I would also agree, but I was wondering, since, uh, first of all, I really liked your talk, but um, I, what I found, sorry, I'm <laughs> uh, <laughs> confused for a second. Um, oh, John I found Rogan. very interesting <laughs> was your emphasizing um, on the perspective mm -hmm. for needs like, to have. So, like this drawing on a being for itself. Mm -hmm. So yeah. then you would need to make a distinction for for living beings who have perspective and others who don't. Yeah. Or then would you say in the end, no, it's just all about being alive? I thank you for that. And I um, I do think that life is the thing. But I do also think there are different ways of being alive. And so I think the amoeba has a different status from, you know, um, from you. Yeah, from yeah. Peter Singer. I would kill the amoeba. <laughs> if my choice is Peter Singer or amoeba, Peter will stay. Yeah, yeah. Lion, Peter Singer, lion has to go. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Peter Singer, Joseph Ross. <laughs> 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 <That's okay>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and I, and I, for me, the, the line, you know, what about my poodle? I have two poodles. I'm very, I, I don't have human children. Um, but, th you know, they're, they're a big part of my life. And so do I think there's some 
you know, objective reason that they matter less than, you know, say, someone's child here. I'm just kind of not persuaded by that in a way. Like, I'm not necessarily, I don't think, like, oh, it's obvious that if I'm, you know, lifeboat scenario and my, and Homer and Kleos are there and, and I have to choose between saving them and saving someone else's child, I'm, I'm not sure I would be remiss to save them. Like, they're my family. <laughs> I love them. Uh, so I, I do think, so, so I feel like we, we often want to think in very um, sort of like well, what matters more than what. Um, and, and I do think that some, we can draw some distinctions that matter. For example, you know, you know, my poodles have a perspective on what happens to them uh, in a way that, you know, a plant in my garden does not. And that makes a, a practical difference. But, you know, um, the practical relevance of my poodles to me um, a lot of that depends on my relationship to them and, and partial factors. You know, let's say you're someone who's, a, who's committed to um, saving some species of plant, you know, then, then that is going to mean that you spend a lot of your life and your energies devoted to, to, to plant life when you could be, you know, giving the same energy and attention to children in need. I don't think that person is somehow acting in a way that's like morally problematic at all, because I think um, it's clear that um, life matters. So, you know, saving the species is, is a perfectly reasonable way to spend one's time. So, so yes, I think life is a thing. I think there are differences, but I don't want to sort of scale it up so that, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of written in the world that this being matters more than this being. I think partial considerations have to enter into um, one's all things considered reasons about what to do in the final, you know, analysis. So, is that responsive? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Vidya. Yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this paper. I find your argument against absolute value utterly convincing. Oh, thank um, you. It's nice to have friends. <laughs> 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 I'm surrounded by Kantians who escort me out of the room at the APA. Well, the funny thing is that I, I consider myself very, very Kantian, okay. but that's precisely why Cord's Sword makes no sense to me. Uh -huh. so. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask in particular about one of the claims you make toward the end of your talk, namely that it's important to work out whether an artificially intelligent system is a subject mm -hmm. if we're going to figure out where they fit in to, to your scene of value. Um, and my question is, why? I'm not convinced that we need to work out whether an AI system is a subject because although your account of valuing hinges on a subject-object mm -hmm. metaphysics, mm -hmm. you were saying you know, value is a dyad that's created yeah. in the relation between subject and object. My response to that is, I wonder if that's really necessary when it seems to me it could construct a, a robust account of valuing without reliance on a subject-object metaphysics and there may in fact be good reasons to do so. So touching a little bit on what you just said about maybe saving the species, right? Um, if we think of something like plant flourishing, which mm -hmm. you mentioned in your talk, um, there's a great chapter of Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass in which she's talking about one of her students' dissertations. Um, she writes her dissertation on sweetgrass. Um, and she's wondering how traditional practices of, of picking sweetgrass affect sweetgrass, sweetgrass population. And her whole committee thinks, well, obviously, picking sweetgrass would be bad for the sweetgrass. Mm -hmm. um, and what she finds when she goes into the field and follows people around who are picking sweetgrass is that in regions where traditional sweetgrass picking is practiced, populations of sweetgrass really, really flourish. So, in fact, there's more sweetgrass in those regions than there are in which there are no traditional practices of sweetgrass picking, right? The reason for this is because the way of picking sweetgrass really attends to how is the population doing, what's the, cli the climate like, how much would be too much, um, and, and we wouldn't want to pick too much so that the population doesn't come back next year, right? That's the idea. Um, now, 
to go back to your system, I'd say a couple things here. I'd say, first of all, this practice is evidently good for the people who pick the sweet grass, right? Because mm -hmm. they get to continue the practice year after year. One might say it's good for the whole population because the sweet grass gets to come back year after year. But the objection would be, tell that to the sweet grass, the blades of sweet grass mm -hmm. that got plucked and killed, right? They're gonna say, hey, what about me? This wasn't good for me. And we might respond to that with the kind of rogue spear claim that, well, the particular blade of sweet grass must die that the species might live. In which case, okay, we might then call the species the subject mm -hmm. and the dyads of value is between that subject and its object of, I don't know, persisting. But it seems to me we would probably hesitate to call a species a subject, at least in, in the strong Kantian sense in which we mean, you know, an intentional entity that gets the meaning of its own being from the Gegenständigkeit of the object, right? So if we don't want to call the species a subject there, but we still want to say there's something like value, there is something good for the sweet grass, mm -hmm. it seems like it would make more sense to do that without having reference to subject object metaphysics, mm -hmm. in which case the question of whether an AI system is a subject ceases to matter, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I'm right about how I laid that up. So I'm, I'm curious what your response to that. That's so great. That was such an interesting question. Thank you. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I had I had several thoughts as you were speaking. One was like, and this is not really that relevant actually to what you ended up saying, but one is like you don't always know what's good for you, right? Um, yeah, uh, so so we think that oh, you know, this practice is going to be detrimental, but actually it makes the the you know um, the 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 species flourish. Um, and yeah, I mean. When we're thinking about organic life, it's so hard to think about the flourishing, you know, independently of a system, right? An ecosystem. So this is this is where your question finds its point. Um, and so the tree, you know, as I said, this Andrea San Giovanni, um, in, in he's a philosopher in England, um, he wants to say that trees don't matter. Um, for their own sake or, or something like this. And I find that I'm not sure I want to say that, that they don't matter for their own sake. Um, I think I want to say that they matter for a larger whole, right, sort of ecosystem, a system of which they're part, that, ma that, that matters for us and for the, 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 the the plants that contribute to it, or for the trees that contribute to it. So that's a kind of different sort of structure. Um, but but anyway, but but yeah, it does occur to me that we're that we, we, it, it doesn't seem like you want to talk about individual like sort of as you know the subject is marked by you know this 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 plant here or that sweet grass you know blade there. So yeah, so does that put pressure on, if we do want to think in a, in a more holistic way, uh, you know, think about it, the subject is at the level of a species or the level of an ecosystem. And I think something like that has got to come into play because we do care about, you know, the, the balance of something as you, were, as you were talking. It's like you want enough, you want to do enough picking to not wipe it out the next time so that, you know, you want to manage the population or whatever for, for the long term. Yeah, so then am I on the hook to sort of countenance, um, you know, y yeah, does it matter that, that um, we, don't ha we don't find a subject in any recognizable sense in the AI context? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good question and, and, and maybe I'm here going to revert to <laughs> life, you know? Maybe that is in the end what it, the, the thing that matters to me. Maybe that's the bedrock. It's not about subject in the, you know, Indivi subject individual, but it's about a living, be it's about something that's alive. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. That's to, div you know, that's to say, yeah, I think there would be a problem, but I'm going to, I'm going to divert, I'm going to maybe hang my, the distinction somewhere else. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Not, not to say pro life, but. <laughs> yeah, it's not to say pro life. <laughs> it's very hard to say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Did I say? No, 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 Did no, I? No, yeah, no, no, thank no, no, you. No. Thanks. I could, I could. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Uh,
I know, I know. Yeah, I know. no, I know. yeah, yeah, yeah. We should co op the term. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay. Here we th it's put that out to Joe Rogan. Yeah. Okay, good, but that's good. I, I had to come out. Of yeah, this. yeah. Let's, let's, you know, let's, uh, let's reclaim pro life. That's yeah. I think that everybody yeah. appreciates. Pro life against AI. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, sorry, I haven't yet messed up all names. Um, on Violet? Yeah. Okay. Okay, please, um, Violet. And then I have Paul, Alex, and. Oh, Paul Pass. Paul Pass, okay. Um, okay, thank you. Thanks, Will. This is amazing. Um, okay, I. <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't, I shouldn't have done it on live TV. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I, have, I have a question related to this. So uh, I don't know much about AI, but I tend to think of AI as a sort of like a, a, a mirror or a reflection tool. Um, and so the question of So, and, and AI is interesting because of its relationship to people. So, so, so I guess my question, and, and maybe it's like kind of true, but so what does AI tell us about our own value? Mm -hmm. And is AI mm -hmm. a reflective of a value that is flourishing, or is it reflective of something that's kind of relinquished? Yeah, that's such a, yeah, I kind of have goosebumps there yeah reading about this stuff and again i i'm just dipping my toe into this little literature but um yeah reading some of these experiments um was slightly horrifying about precisely like what it tells us about where we're at as a as a civilization you know because a lot of the technology seems to be commercially driven um and so what what do people want you know they want sex toys and they want um, they want robots to mine their infants because the underpaid, um, you know, uh, people uh, who work at the childcare centre need help. You know, <laughs> like what the fuck? <laughs> so, um, and and you know, or or um, indeed, you know, uh, companions for the elderly, right? So, what does this tell us about? our sort of breakdown in, in relationships and in civilization. I mean, it's not a pretty story. Um, uh, but, but, but maybe, I, you know, maybe I'm reading only the kind of the dark parts of the literature. Maybe there, are there is a kind of uplifting potential. And, you know, um, yeah, that I'm not, that I'm just not familiar with. But, yeah, I think it does, I think it is a mirror in the way that you suggested. I think it is a big mirror. Um, a mirror not just of like <laughs> a social breakdown, but also our kind of ludicrous ideas about the mind, our ludicrous ideas about like the world and, and ourselves, you know. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, um, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, the detritus of uh, human knowledge. That was a very, really helpful yeah. way of saying what's wrong with the storage, right? That's also why you get all this new nonsense vocabulary, right? I mean, the, the, no app has like a good name, right? I mean, Wikipedia is like the worst idea name for an encyclopedia, right? Mm -hmm. I can tell you why, why it was called an encyclopedia, right? But like a Wikipedia, it's like a Wikipedia or whatever. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, where do we even start, yeah. right? Yeah. And so the whole, uh, the whole vocabulary, 
right? That's floating around. Yeah. Uh, once you you know, uh, dig your uh, heels deeper into that world, indeed has a remarkable uh, linguistic shape. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, uh, yeah. I had this, you know, the usual, you know, bring the piece back again into the discussion chat GPT thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like so great and blah, blah, blah. And we were in Ischia, a beautiful Italian island. And, you know, the person had to have their iPhone with them all the time. And it's like, okay, mm -hmm. then let's do the chat GPT thing. And it said, like, okay, write a poem about Ischia in the style of Goethe, right? Mm -hmm. And then we did Hölderlin. And it's like, it was all like the worst possible <laughs> case. It's like, in no world, yeah. you know, uh, would yeah. it be possible for like the literature professor to get this? Oh, we found the new Hölderlin <laughs> poem about Ischia, right? Um, yeah. Uh, um, so uh, th 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 there's this remarkable mm -hmm. th form of deviation mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that is generated by AI. Like think of the paintings, right? They're like yeah. weirdly, like like someone's on a like really unhealthy LSD trip, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like the really un. They're, they're typically not super healthy, but mm -hmm. like a particularly unhealthy hallucination, right? This is how this AI uh, stuff looks. And I think yeah. that that might be a side effect of, uh, I think, your nice way of putting it, right? Yeah, and, and in that connection, I was, I was, I was curious about, um, you know, the sort of whether the chat uh, GPT can, can make value judgments, you know? So, ask the, you know, so I was asking that, I was asking whether um, and it just was the first book that came to mind, Philippa Foote's Natural Goodness is a Worthwhile Work of Philosophy, right? And the sort of answer that you get is you're sort of drawing, I mean, it will kind of draw together, so so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that. But when you push it and you say, yeah, but what do you, what do you think? It's, it, it's sort of like that question can't register. It's, and, it, and it sort of defaults to a sort of relativism that, you know, is again a symptom of... <laughs> Like the worst parts of our culture, it seems to me. So, yeah. Alex, did you just say again? Something? Again. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. That was not a critique. Just, I was just saying Alex again. Um, <laughs> did you just say something again about um, how you understand the dual nature of human beings, which you referred to last week with the, mm. the previous question I asked? satisfies the four criteria so you can uh that's so interesting so you can um um deliberate in terms of it you are emotionally sensitive to things going badly for you 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 seek things that are you seek things that are harmful for yourself that that kind of thing yeah that's <laughs> i feel uh, that's such an interesting question um and I mean, I, I am a very committed practitioner of psychoanalysis. I've <laughs> been in analysis for 10 years, and I'm turning to think about Freud seriously. I haven't thought about the death drive, um, um, apart from on the couch, as it were. <laughs> so I, I um, you know, sort of like recognize it in my own life. But when I, I so, so, so it hasn't, penetrated to, to my philosophical kind of official stance on things. And in that regard, I mean, I think of, there's a, there's a moment in Plato's Meno where um, Meno is defending the view that sometimes people pursue things 
that they see as bad, right? And, and Socrates is really pushing this, really pushing this. Do you mean um, they see it as good, but it's in fact bad? Or do you mean that they see it as bad under the guise of being bad, right? That's the kind of real claim. And, and Mino says, no, the second thing, the second thing, sometimes we pursue what's bad knowing that it's bad. And Socrates, um, and I'm interested in, in this passage because for Socrates, you know, the good benefits and the bad harms, you know, for, for him that these are just conceptual claims. And so he then says, you know, but the bad harms, right? And there's a conceptual connection between harm and being made miserable. Um, and, and, you know, Mino says, yes, Socrates. And, and, and then he rephrases the question, well, does anyone want to be miserable and unhappy? Oh, well, when you put it that way, no one wants to be miserable and unhappy, you know. Um, and, and so he, he, you know, so that's, that's the way Socrates wins that argument. And, yeah, I mean, uh, there's a part of me that thinks that's kind of right at the level of intentional action. But when we're talking about death drives, I mean, that introduces the unconscious. And um, I am very interested in that, but don't have well, I don't, I, I don't know if I can be drawn out into, into that, uh, in, into taking a stand on that. So in a, in a way, my official answer would be no, <laughs> so in a way, yeah. yeah. You know, well the, two, well the two options are um, pursuing something is is bad while thinking that it's good, right? That claim does not um, show that we don't act under the guise of the good or under the guise of the beneficial, as Socrates will also put it. The second thing, acting, uh, pursuing what's bad, knowing that it's bad, um, pursuing or desiring, and Socrates insists that what we mean by that is um, wanting to secure for ourselves. By desire, we want to secure that thing for ourselves. And the bad is the harmful. Do we ever want to secure what is harmful for ourselves, no, you know, realizing that we'll be made miserable thereby? I guess I feel the force of, of the no there, you know, like, no, we don't want that. No, we don't want that. Um, that's my official stance, but I, I, I recognize that there's more to say when one thinks about the unconscious. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask you, because you glided over this, uh, it wasn't constitutive of the talk, but it made its appearance mm -hmm. at some point in the, uh, early in the paper, the moral versus non-moral mm -hmm. distinction, yeah. right? So, mm -hmm. of course, you know, like, I, I can now add, uh, as it were, comments on why life, you know, and then they would sound something like, uh, Necentropic, you know, self-sustaining systems mm. with a particular type of Mariology mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, and uh, uh, and uh, things that do not have this type of integration on the other hand, plus not made out of the relevant material, etc., mm -hmm. etc. And now I can see those necentropic, self-sustaining, mm -hmm. autopoietic mm -hmm. systems, mm -hmm. right, as generating conditions of harm and not harm. Right on the lowest level of amoeba normativity, mm -hmm. right, and on the highest level of philosophical reflection on the just state, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. All those levels that have those considerations of harm and so forth, structural. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, I can also easily imagine scenarios where you know what we classify as evil engages in practices of self uh, maintenance uh, and therefore has criteria of harm and benefit, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et right, mm -hmm. so. Some things that are beneficial to Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. are, I think, immoral, right? Mm -hmm. And I would not want to have a view or value mm -hmm. that commits me to saying it's not beneficial to him, right? Because many things which are immoral about, you know, his immediate surrounding and mm -hmm. external causal influence, right, are such that, you know, we would say that's bad, but it's certainly good for him. So, and I wouldn't want to say, you know, in a Socratic tone of voice, 
uh, on closer inspection, it's not good for you. Right? He's like, no, no, on closest inspections, the fact that I own Russia, that I'm rich beyond your wildest imagination, right? All the French kings together would count as poor people compared to me. That's what we are talking about here. And that is very good for me, right? Now, the Iskander rockets on uh, Ukrainian kindergartens are very bad for those children, and I know that, right? I, uh, uh, but, you know, like none of this makes this worse for me, right? And so, and I wouldn't want to go in as a Socratic agent and say, well, Vladi, come on, let's analyze the case. <laughs> and and at some point, it's like, oh my God, it is not that great for me to own Russia. He would always say, no, no, it's really great to own Russia. You should try it, right? <laughs> uh, that's what he said to Prigozhin. And then, yeah. uh, but anyhow, so like, wh how do you draw, if at all, uh, or is there a way for you to circumvent a distinction? That needn't be a distinction between non-relational and mm. relational value, right? Mm. But um, so which of the goods are, uh, would count as morally good, or, or do you have reasons for dispensing with this question? I mean, I'm, I'm with Socrates here, yeah. I think, okay, you, you know, okay. I am. And I, and I, I do, I think that Putin's, you know, um, I think it is bad for him that he's blowing up Ukrainian children. That's definitely bad for him. Yeah. yeah. But it's good for him to own Russia. Well, I don't know. I don't, I, I mean, on what, in what, what ha on what terms? I mean, he's doing so through, you know, through. I see. You would say the yeah. full description. The full description. The full of description the of the case is such that yeah, it's guess. not beneficial for yeah, him. Um, okay. So that's that's the kind of ethically committed, and yeah. I don't want to. I don't want. You know, I'm not a morality person. I mean, I, I'm an ethics person, and so I do want to think in terms of virtue and vice. And yeah. so I I think I, I have an ethically kind of co loaded um, uh, sort of view of of the beneficial. Yeah. 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 And so, do you think it's, this is conceptual or deeper? Deeper, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. both, but deeper, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. course, yeah. Okay. yeah, good, yeah, no, no, I see that, that's fine, that's, mm. uh, that's kind thank of awkward. you, good. no, yeah, mm. no, I'm always, when I'm in a room with a Neoplatonist, is, <laughs> I grew up uh, among Neoplatonists, <laughs> mm. and I've tried very hard not to become one, mm -hmm. but when, I, when I'm surrounded by them, I feel kind of, like, comfortable, <laughs> and I think, I think at the end of the day, it's probably true, but I'm too young to say so, right, I mean, and I want to, I want to be, like, 95, and and, and have I've that conviction, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. The Quine stuff was just a facade, <laughs> I was always, okay. <laughs> okay, Inga. Amen. 
Yeah, I mean, this term relational is used in a variety of contexts. You know, um, we can talk about, um, you know, people are interested in like a relational stance or, you know, Stephen Darwell is very interested in the second person, how we address others, right? The, the you is somehow very, very important. And um, so that, that, um, that is one way of thinking about relationality. Um, a self to another self. And I'm thinking of the concept of relation in a, in a broader way. I mean, it includes that. In, it includes relations. Um, when we're talking to one another and having a conversation, when we're friends with one another or colleagues or what have you, um, and those relations are going to be structured by forms of acknowledgement um, and um, whatever is appropriate to the relationship, if it's friendship, you know, sort of forms of forms of love that are appropriate to friendship and so on. Um, now, this, the second part of your question um, was about the kind of epistemic question, like how do we know um, that something is actually good for us or actually beneficial? And I think that that's a big question. Um, I think often when we don't like something, we think it's harmful, and I think we're often mistaken. I think, um, you know, pleasure and pain is a sort of primitive system that's designed to guide us towards things and away from things, but it is highly sort of, you know, um, uh, sensitive to reward hacking, to <laughs> refer to that experiment, or, you know, it, it, fearful, right? So so it's not, an, it's not reliable, and... Um, a lot of things that we're afraid of and don't want to do might be might be good for us. Um, so it's often in hindsight, you know, we th we think back, oh, that time that was that I didn't like and that I thought was so terrible was the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> you know, people speak like that, um, and so often, yeah, we don't know um, what is in fact uh, beneficial for us, and 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 um, so so it's a, it's a big question, um, and and. Um, I think I like this, the spirit of, you know, the Socratic spirit that, that sees that as a really important, you know, if not sort of the important question in ethics. How do you really know um, what is in the end beneficial? Yeah. So, so that for me sets up a kind of, um, you know, research program. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. Um, thank you. I hope that was responsive. Yeah. Thank you. Well, then let me thank uh, in particular Nandi and uh, everybody else for yet another great session. So, thank you.